Well, good evening, everyone. Hi. <laughs> Welcome back. I told Caleb that I wanted a headset like a TED Talk thing so that I could roam around and use my hands, but we're not quite there yet. But, but someday I'll be like a, like a TED Talk professional with a, everything, all the, all the appropriate gear. So I'm going to try to leave this here tonight and not move around too much. That's my, that's my, my goal. So welcome, we're talking about Brunelleschi and Florence tonight and the Florentine Renaissance and the idea behind the, the architecture of, of the Renaissance, with particularly the, the early Renaissance, I'm talking about the 1400s mostly. I promised to talk about this in a fit of exuberance during my last lecture. We, uh, about three weeks ago we did, a, we did a session on the Notre Dame and Gothic architecture. And uh, I'm not an architect. I, I feel really at home talking about painting. I'm like, I get this. I know how painting works. I can, I can sympathize. But, uh, but architecture, I'm like, oh, I should, I'm going to get back to painting for the next one. And then I was like, let's talk about Brunelleschi and the dome. Won't that be great? So I, uh, I locked myself into that. But that's fine. I love talking about uh, the, the Florentine Renaissance. So uh, as promised, Brunelleschi's, uh, Brunelleschi's dome. So, so this, of course, is, uh, is Florence, as, as it appears today. And in 1418, the, uh, the Opera del Duomo, so this is the, the, the committee for the opera. The, the word Duomo is Italian for cathedral. So when these people say, we're going to the Duomo, that we're going to the cathedral. So the, the big cathedral, which we're talking about tonight in Florence, actually has a, a name. It's called the Santa Maria del Fiore. Uh, but Obviously, it looks like it's the only one, so people, the Duomo, the Duomo, so we're talking about the Duomo tonight. In 1418, uh, the Opera del Duomo, so like I said, the committee in charge of the, the oversight of, of the cathedral, put out a call, there was a, a competition to design the dome for the cathedral. So in 1418, the, the dome, I'm supposed to use my laser pointer also, <laughs> and there it goes. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Caleb says, I, I, I get too close to this. I, I don't know, I interfere with the filming. And he said, use your laser pointer. For the love of goodness, please use it. I gave it to you, use it. So in, before 1418, the only part of the cathedral that had been constructed was the nave, laser pointer. This is the nave, this part here. And, and the space where the dome was supposed to fit remained uh, empty. So basically, the, that section of the cathedral was open to the elements. And there was a call. They knew they wanted a dome, and I'll fill in a bit of that story. They knew they wanted a dome, and, and they, they put out a call for, for architects to come up with an idea, a scheme to, to uh, create this structure. And, uh, but I'll, I'll set a bit of the stage, too, to, to kind of give you a bit of context for what, what Florence was like and why they had the ambition to, to create something like this. I mean, this is, again, one of the most iconic architectural features uh, in, in the world and is really a, a symbol of the, of the Italian Renaissance. So Florence in the 1300s, 1400s was one of the most prosperous cities in Europe. They had about 50,000 people, which sounds teeny tiny, but 50,000 people put them on par with London at the time. So it was a, a, thriving, a thriving center for trade uh, and, uh, and mercantile uh, culture. They were, uh, they were so good at uh, um, trade and uh, they, they worked in the, they had great um, uh, wool industry. They would bring in wool from, from England and, and dye it and, and transform it into, into beautiful cloth and, and ship that then all over the world. So this enormous wealth was flowing into, into Florence. And there was a construction boom uh, in, in the 1300s. So this is very, very late uh, Middle Ages. So about 100, 200 years after the Notre Dame had been built. Okay, so kind of late Gothic period. And, and like I said, there was a flurry of construction, and, uh, and, and Florence was on the rise as a city. They built, which you can see, you can see here, this is the laser pointer. Uh, this is the, uh, the, the Palazzo della Signoria, so this is like the, the civic center of the city, the city hall with its enormous tower. 
They built a new ring of, uh, of, of defenses, of wall structures around uh, the city, which you can still see today. The, the walls kind of pop up. You cross the wall and then cross back into the wall to the city center. The, oh, it was closer than I expected. I got to not look around. <laughs> Very elegant. <laughs> All right, maybe I should hang on to it. Maybe that would be a good... No, I am going to hang on to it. I feel too constricted here. I'm too, I'm too constricted. i gotta, I got to move about. Sorry, Caleb. Okay, I'm moving this. And then I won't run into it, hopefully. <laughs> okay, oh, this is much better. I'm much happier now. So this is the, this is the, the Campanile, which is the, the bell tower. Uh, for, the, the, for the Duomo, so for the cathedral. This is the cathedral in behind. And the Campanile was built in the 1300s, again, part of this, this great uh, extravagant uh, 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 building boom. There were numerous, um, uh, so th these, are, these are public structures being built, but there were numerous uh, private palazzos, so private palaces also being built by these uh, wealthy merchants. Oh, this is the, the Palazzo della Signoria. These are enormously tall structures. Again, you think for the late Middle Ages, I mean, these were, these were over 200, square, 200, 200 feet high. So soaring, soaring monuments for this, for this early Renaissance city. This is the, the square of the, the Piazza della Signoria. A side note, I'm not talking about Michelangelo's David tonight, but I just have to tell you this. So initially, Michelangelo's David was supposed to be mounted at the top of the Palazzo della Signoria, and that's why his head is so big and his hands are so large, because it's meant to be viewed from the ground. And then when Michelangelo revealed the sculpture to, to the, the, the city leaders, they said, no, we can't, we can't put that at the top of the building. So then they put, uh, they put Michelangelo's David in this is a replica here now, but they put Michelangelo's David in the square itself. Side note, we'll talk about Michelangelo another, another time, but just so you know when you're in the square. So you can say, if anybody says, why is his head so big? That's, that's why. He's supposed to be up high. My students always point out, why is his head so big? I'm talking about like the beauty of the Renaissance nude. Like his head is too big. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, dear. So, so there was, like I said, this, this flurry of activity in the, in the late 1300s and, and the, the, the Florentine uh, people decided they wanted a cathedral that could match this growing city. They wanted one of the grandest cathedrals in the world. And there was a, a crumbling, do I have that? Yes, there was a, a crumbling, kind of very small, dilapidated um, church on the site of the, the current Santa Maria del Fiore called uh, uh, Santa Repar Rep Reparata, Rep I always miss a syllable there. Anyway, maybe I have it on there. Reparata, oh, I did say it right, good. So, so the old cathedral existed here. They tore that down and they started the construction of, of the current Duomo in the, in the 1300s. And over the course of 100 years, they, they leveled entire forests to, to build the scaffolding, to, to construct the, the, the main part of the church, the nave. Huge slabs of marble were sent down the Arno River. But the, 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 the dome part of the church, the high altar, remained, uh, remained empty. So, so basically, if you can imagine, it's really hard to do a lecture building up to the construction of the dome when the dome already exists. So if you can just imagine that that's not there. So that's what existed in the, in the late 1300s. And when, when they initially conceived of this new cathedral, they were, they were trying to decide on the, the design for this church. So, so there were two ways that the, the church construction could go. It could be a Gothic-esque uh, church, which you all should know if you were at my Notre Dame lecture. It would be like pointy, yes, pointy. It could be pointy. No, I'm pointing out round. Yes, thank you, thank you. 
with spires and flying buttresses, or it could, um, it could harken back to something more from the classical age. So looking back instead to ancient Rome in particular and to something more classical, so looking more at like an arch or a dome. And there was, a, again, a competition. It was very uh, common kind of in the, the um, late medieval period and in the Renaissance to have architectural competitions to, to get to the, the best idea from, and, and, and force architects to compete with each other. And there was an architect named Neri, and he suggested a dome that would, again, look back more, that would look more Roman, ancient Roman, than, than medieval. And, and why this was, it was a particular, something really special happened in, in Florence in the late 1300s and in the 1400s that really made it the center of, of the early Renaissance. And I, and I think a lot of it has to do with, with the way that Italy was, was, uh, was structured at the time. Italy itself, Italy as a country, didn't exist until the 1800s. Italy was divided into uh, sections. So it was divided into city-states. And each city-state had a very uh, fierce sense of, of, of civic pride or local pride. And there was comp I mean, competition in terms of architecture and, and cultural achievements. But I mean, they would, you know, the, the Sienese would attack the, the Florentines, and then the Florentines would attack the Sienese, and then the, the, the Duke of Milan would strut on down and try to take over Florence. And, and the, the papal state, so we talked about Julius II a couple uh, lectures ago, the warrior pope would decide that he wanted to take over a, a chunk of, he wanted to take over uh, Perugia, and so he would get on his horse and march up, uh, march north to go, to go uh, invade uh, or expand the, the papal states. So there was this uh, fierce sense of, of local identity, so, so it meant something to be Florentine, or it meant something to be, to be Sienese, rather than, than Italian as a, as a whole. And the Florentines, they, they didn't like the French. They did not want no flying buttresses, nothing pointy. They hated pointy spires. It looked like the French and the Germans, the Goths. So where the, the word Goth, they described anything, anything that wasn't uh, in the Renaissance, the, the, kind of the, the idea of Gothic as being something kind of bad or dark uh, came from the, the Renaissance thinkers, because that's how they would describe that's how they looked at the period that, that, uh, that came before. So anything not, uh, anything not Italian or, or classical was oh, so ugly, so Gothic. So no, no, flying, no flying buttresses, no spires. And particularly, they did not want to look like their arch enemy, the Milanese, Milan. They hated Milan very, very much. And, um, the Duke of Milan, and the, and the difference also, so, so Florence was a republic, I mean, republic. There were, there were a group of uh, 13 men who were elected to run the city. Uh, it was very much, again, if you can picture Romeo and Juliet, okay, I mean, there are certain houses that have power and they strut through the city with their swords and, you know, I mean, democratic to, to an extent, but, um, but they still identified themselves very much as a republic versus Milan, which was a duchy. So uh, Milan had a duke. And the, the Florentines thought that was just lame, as was their cathedral. Look at all that pointy stuff. <laughs> so gothic. So they did not want their cathedral to look, to look like the one in Milan. The Duke of Milan would periodically, actually when, when the Duomo in, in Florence was under construction, the, the, the Milanese and the, the Duke of Milan would periodically invade uh, Florence and one time it was looking really, really dire. And, and the Duke of Milan was camped out with his army and outside the walls of Florence and oh, it was looking bad. But the, the plague came through and killed, killed everybody. I mean, it killed half of Florence and half of the Milanese army. But the Florentines are still like, God likes us the best. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and the Duke of Milan had to skulk, skulk home with, with half his army. But I mean, the plague came through like every 10 years. So anyway. But yes, triumph for, for, for Florence. Good for Florence. Where was I? Uh, so yes, no, no spires, no flying buttresses. We want a dome. But the problem was is that they had no idea, no idea whatsoever how to go about constructing a dome. 
The technology had been lost, so there was a, do I have the, oh, good. Sometimes I surprise, I'm like, I hope I have a picture of the Pantheon next, and then it pops up, I'm like, man, I'm so, previous me is so thoughtful of, of current me, so. <laughs> This is the, the Pantheon in Rome, and, and, and this, of course, has a, a massive dome, which is really hard to see from, from the outside. It's, uh, uh, so this is the, the, the piazza in front of the, the Pantheon, and then you, you enter, and then, of course, there's this massive, massive uh, a stone dome. So, so the, the Romans had the knowledge of how to construct a, a dome. This was the, the largest in the world at the time. But, but the knowledge of how to construct that or how to pull off this architectural marvel had, had largely been lost, and there had been nothing like this constructed since. So no, no domes like this at all in, in medieval architecture. But the Florentines are like, yep, that's what we want. We want it, we can do it, guys. And there's this great, and I think, when, I, when I'm thinking about the, the, the Renaissance idea, or what, uh, what is driving the Florentine Renaissance, I think it's this, it's this leap of faith that they take over and over and over again. So the, 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 the group that, or the, the, the Florentines, when they decide on adopting Neri's design for the dome, there is not an architect that, li that was living at the time that had the capacity to construct a dome. But they believed that Florence would produce an architect who could do it at some point in the future. So, so we're gonna do the dome, Someone will come along who can build it. And I think that that's, that happens again and again and again in Florence, like this, this great kind of faith in, in humanity. And that's kind of the, this also the, the driving idea or the central idea behind uh, the early Renaissance and the late Renaissance is this turn to humanity or this interest in, in humanism and the, the capacity of, of humankind to create marvelous things. So in the 1300s, again, about 100 years before Budaleski comes along, they decide we want, a, we want a dome to look like the Pantheon. Also, we want it to be bigger than the Pantheon. <laughs> also, we want it to start 170 feet up in the air, which the Pantheon doesn't, right? I mean, this is, I think these people look a little small, but this is like maybe 20, 30 feet high, and then the dome starts in, in Florence. It's 170 feet up in the air, right? So they want this dome, but higher. Right, here it is. <laughs> so. Not a dome starting here. They want a dome up in, up in the air. So along comes, thankfully, they had faith. Along comes uh, uh, an architect and uh, actually a goldsmith named Filippo Brunelleschi. He's a looker, isn't he, with the ears. <laughs> uh, he, uh, he was 41 in 1418 and, and He's, oh, he's one of these delightfully odd characters in art history. You know, I think all the time, I probably think way too much about this, who I would like to hang out with for a day, and it might be, Brunelleschi's a contender. <laughs> he, uh, he was very secretive and paranoid. I'm actually making him not sound like a good dinner guest, but anyway, we'll start off with this and we'll get to the good stuff. <laughs> very secretive and paranoid. He wrote all of his notes in, uh, in ciphers or in codes because he was scared of people taking his ideas and his, his designs. Uh, he was really grumpy, but he could also really have a good time. He was a, a great prankster. Should I tell you? I'll tell you the story now. So, uh, uh, Brunelleschi, like I said, I mean, it was 50,000 50, people in, in Florence. You got to know one another. And, uh, and Brunelleschi, I think, was, was a, a character on the, the Florentine scene. And, and one of the most famous stories about Brunelleschi Yes, I'll tell you this now, so then you have a sense of who he is. Okay, so Brunelleschi uh, could, hold a, could hold a grudge, and he could, he could really get even. And there was a carpenter, yes, there was a carpenter uh, named Manetto, who slighted Brunelleschi in some way. We think that he didn't go to one of Brunelleschi's parties, and Brunelleschi did not like that one bit. So he decided to get back at uh, Manetto, and when Manetto left his house, Brunelleschi snuck in, closed the door, locked Manetto out. And then when Manetto tried to get back in, Brunelleschi in uh, 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 imitated his voice, said, no, you know, I'm already at home. You can't come in. Manetto's at home. 
And then Mineta was kind of dazed, and, and he wandered out into the, into the piazza, and a little confused why he can't get into his own house. And Bruno Leschi had orchestrated this massive scheme, and, and hoodwinked, got everyone in Florence to participate in this. And uh, <laughs> there was a, a Florentine named Matteo, who was a kind of a rich merchant, and he was in on it too. And he, Bruno Leschi had the Florentine guards arrest Mineto, saying, oh, Matteo, calling him Matteo, Matteo, you owe a bunch of money, we're going to throw you in jail. And Mineto's like, no, 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 I'm, I'm Mineto, I'm not Matteo, you can't throw me in jail. I'm like, no, 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 Matteo, I have to keep this straight, Matteo, we know who you are, we're going to put you in jail. And he said, no, 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 go get my wife, go get my wife, she'll, she'll identify me. And somehow Bruno Leschi uh, convinced the wife to take part in, in his scheme. <laughs> even with the years. <laughs> and, uh, and the wife turned up and said, no, 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 this isn't my, this isn't my husband, Manetto, this is Matteo. And of course, poor Manetto now is, is very confused and, 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 and bewildered, spends a night in jail, and, uh, and, and gets out. And now I forget how they get him back home. Maybe they get him drunk. Oh, I think they get him drunk. He comes out, and then his friends take him to a pub, and they get him really drunk. And his friend's like, oh, Mateo, Mateo, you're out of jail. Like, let's go to the pub and get drunk. So they get him drunk. Then they, he passes out drunk. They take him back to his original house. So this is Manetto's original house, Brunelleschi and his gang. They plant him back in his bed upside down. And then he wakes up the next day and, and, and of course, thinking that, yes, maybe he is Matteo, maybe this is his life, but then he's back in his house and he's upside down and, and his wife and... Anyway, so he, uh, he, was, he was flummoxed for a, for a while in Florence and, uh, and I think quite uh, irate at Brunelleschi and <laughs> kind of the butt of many, many jokes. I think he, there was this joke about the, the fat carpenter. It was like going around Florence. The fat, the, the, did you hear the story of the fat carpenter? Ha ha ha, and what Brunelleschi did to him. Anyway, but then he moved to Germany and made boatloads of money, so it all worked out for <laughs> Benetto. But this is who we're dealing with. Brunelleschi, uh, um, I think, could be, could be potentially a lot of fun and, and uh, uh, maybe like a less violent Caravaggio, okay? Like, you know, wasn't, wasn't killing anybody, but... But, you know, he wasn't solely focused on his, on his practice, on his craft. He had a good time. And uh, Bruno Leschke, why is this here? Why am I... Oh, yes, okay, sorry. I don't, earlier me confused the present me this time. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, yes, Bruno Leschke uh, uh, comes up with a design. He says, look, guys, I, I can construct the dome, but I'm not going to tell you how. I know I can do it, you'll have to trust me. So we'll put a pin in that story. So this is 1418. And, and then I'm going to back up and tell you where Brunelleschi came from and why ultimately the, the Opera del Duomo, so the committee that was in charge of the Duomo, why they gave Brunelleschi the commission when Brunelleschi wouldn't even tell them what his plan was. This is why this is here. Uh, so <laughs> Brunelleschi, uh, Yes. Brunelleschi um, uh, really kind of rose to prominence uh, in his earlier life, about 20 years uh, prior to him saying, I can construct the dome, uh, but I'm not telling you how. When there was another competition uh, put on by the, the Wool Guild, the Woolen Guild in, uh, in Florence. So the guilds were a, kind of a, a network or a society that were, were just like a, a society of merchants. So it would be a society of wool merchants. And then they would act as benefactors, or they would commission work to then donate to, to a church, or they would commission a sculpture or something to, to, to then donate and, and uh, kind of build their stature, right? So it was like a, like a sponsorship, basically, sponsored by the Woolen Guild. And uh, there were a set of doors. Uh, th this is, back up, this is the, the baptistry uh, in, in Florence. It's just outside of the, the main entrance to, to the Duomo. So this is the baptistry here. This, this is a medieval structure, so this was built during that boom in the 1300s. There is a great mosaic. I should have put a picture in. There is a great mosaic. I'll save that for another lecture. We'll do a lecture about like the best devils in our history. There is a great devil in, on the ceiling in, uh, in mosaics in the baptistry. So go inside the baptistry, pro tip, if you're, if you're in Florence. Uh, where was I? Oh yes, so this is the baptistry. <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, I get sidetracked. So there are three, three sets of doors on the baptistry, and this is where they baptize, a baptistry, they baptize uh, people, so it's outside of the, the church. It's a fairly, fairly common structure. It was a very, I mean, this was a, uh, a, a central space for the Florentines. Every Florentine was baptized here, so it was a very, very sacred building. Three sets of doors. One door had been constructed in the, the, the Middle Ages by um, Pisano. It's an enormous bronze doors. It's hard to, to give the, a sense of scale here on these photos, but they're, you know, 15 feet high. Enormous, enormous bronze doors. So very, I mean, this is a, a bronze is really, really complicated. And, uh, and to be a, a bronze sculptor is, um, uh, I mean, that's like, it, it, it's an achievement. So it would have been read as this kind of monumental commission. And the, the Woolen Guild, they had a, they had the south doors. Yes, the south doors existed and they, and they wanted it. They held a competition for the north doors. I might be flipping that about. I always mix that up, but I'm pretty sure it's the north doors. Not that it matters. It's all in the same building. Anyway. And now we set up a rivalry. I think this is one of the best, best rivalries in, uh, in art history, there's another one between Bernini and Borromini, which I promised, maybe I, I shouldn't commit to things. But anyway, I'll talk about that maybe another time. That's another architecture story. I shouldn't commit to these architecture things. Anyway, uh, it, between uh, uh, Lorenzo, this is uh, Lorenzo Ghiberti, so between Ghiberti and, uh, and Brunelleschi. And, and what the competition was, where should I show you? I'll show you this. Okay. Uh, the, the, the Woolen Guild announced a competition, like a design competition, and there were very specific instructions. They gave the, the artists, the sculptors, uh, a certain amount of bronze, and they had to, they're quite large, they're about maybe three feet by three feet. They wanted a scene depicted in bronze of the sacrifice of Isaac. And, and so that's what we see here. And, uh, and the, the, the competition eventually came down to seven, seven sculptors, two of whom were, one was Ghiberti, one was Brunelleschi. And the story, these are the only two surviving competition panels, but the story that's kind of been inherited, I think the truth is in there somewhere, but the story that's been inherited that these were the two finalists, okay, Ghiberti and Brunelleschi, so we'll, we'll, look, we'll look at them one by one and kind of talk about the differences and, and why they're, they're so important. And then why, why Ghiberti and Brunelleschi hate each other's guts for their entire lives. Maybe Brunelleschi did. Ghiberti seems like a nice guy. He probably didn't hold a grudge, but Brunelleschi held a grudge. So we'll start with, uh, with Ghiberti's. And these, these, why am I going to linger on these ones, uh, or, or these, these pieces? Uh, a lot of uh, art historians, or, or, or if you're reading any kind of survey of, of art history, it's often these competition panels that are held up as the marker. These, this is the start of the Florentine Renaissance. And I'll show you why. There's a, there's a few, between Ghiberti and Brunelleschi, they do something completely radical with this. And it's a, it's a massive, massive aesthetic shift away from the medieval, uh, the medieval approach. Yes, OK, Ghiberti first. So the story of the sacrifice of Isaac, uh, Abraham uh, is commanded by God to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. This is a big deal. I mean, obviously, it's his, it's his son. Which is, <laughs> yes, it is a big deal to sacrifice your son. But Abraham had waited a really, really long time to have Isaac. And, uh, and, and, and God gave him Isaac late in life. And, uh, and this was a test, a test of, of Abraham's faith. And so Abraham takes Isaac uh, uh, to, a, to an altar to be, to be sacrificed. And just at the last moment before the, the, the blow falls, an angel, God sends angel to stop Abraham's hand. And so Abraham was, God could see that Abraham was intending to indeed sacrifice his son and, and confirm, his, confirm his faith. So that's the story. That's what the, the cloth guild wanted for their, for their competition panels. So, so in Ghiberti's version, we have uh, Abraham in the center, and his, and his right arm is drawn back, 
And, and he's, he's grasping, it looks like kind of behind, like grasping the, the nape of the neck or the hair of Isaac. And this is, if you look at Isaac's pose here, Isaac is on his knees on this, uh, this kind of altar. This is a very um, classically expressed young male nude. So this is, it's anatomically correct. You can see the, the anatomical details in the, in the torso especially. It's a very uh, elegant pose. So, I mean, even though this is a scene of violence, there is a, there is a, there's a, like a contraposto, like a, like a, so a turning, a counterpose, we talked about that in some previous lecture, but a counterpose, it was something of great interest in the Renaissance, it was one of the, the, the focal points of, of the, the Renaissance figure, or depiction of the Renaissance figure, and that's when the weight, it looks very stiff and boring to depict a figure uh, with, the, with weight distributed evenly between both legs. But as soon as you shift weight on one leg and off the other leg, all kinds of interesting things happen in the human body. So your hip extends in one direction and your shoulder goes in another direction and then your head can tilt on an axis and all kinds of interesting stuff happens. And the ancient Greek and Romans loved contraposto. So you think of the, the Venus de Milo, like that's a very um, uh, exaggerated, very extended, her knee is forward, right? So it's a very uh, extended counterpose, contraposto. In the Middle Ages, not interested at all in contraposto. They're too busy getting the point across, which I'll show you in a minute. They don't care, but, but you can see Ghiberti and then Brunelleschi are, are starting to be very, very interested in the, the, the way that the human body can express emotion and, and angst. There's a couple other figures down here in the, in the foreground and a, and a horse or a donkey. And then, and then this rocky outcropping kind of flowing from, from the top, uh, oh, laser pointer, sorry, from the top left to the bottom right. And then an angel flies in. Oh, wrong way. There we go. The angel flies in. Where's Caleb? Anyway. <laughs> the angel flies in from the top right to stop Abraham. But there's, there's, it's, uh, it's very balanced. There's kind of this diagonal from, from the upper left to the bottom right, and then the same thing from the bottom left to the upper right. And this, 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 uh, oh, this, this line here. Caleb, what, what, why I'm having trouble with this, we film our lectures, and when Caleb is posting them or editing them for, for our website, he'll superimpose the image, but then I'll walk in behind it, so then it looks like I'm disappearing in behind the image, so. Anyway, yes. We've, it's been pointed out that that looks very, very odd. So <laughs> I've been instructed to stay on this side of the, of the slide, but it's, uh, it's very tempting. Anyway, so there's a very elegant, my point is there's interest in human anatomy and it's a very elegant comp uh, composition that we see here. And then Brunelleschi's panel. And see, he's not as, um, uh, I don't think he's quite as adept as, as Ghiberti in the, in the human anatomy, but I think there's a little more uh, kind of expression or, or uh, violence really in, in Brunelleschi's version. So here again, we have, we have a couple figures in the, in the foreground inspecting their feet, which I think is, which I think is really great, this, this figure here. <laughs> picking a rock out of his shoe. He's picking a rock out of his shoe. Huh. Look at that. <sighs> Anyway, uh, Abraham in the, the, uh, the uh, center right, again, has the knife. And, and in this instance, uh, the, 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 the figure of Isaac isn't so um, kind of classically rendered. So kind of the, the, the nudity or kind of the, the anatomy of the, of the male figure isn't foregrounded. But look at Abraham. He has Isaac by the neck, by the neck. He's going in. He's doing it, going in for the kill. He's got the knife. And then an angel, m much more abruptly than Ghibertes, flies in from the left and grasps the arm of, of Abraham, uh, stopping him at the, the very, very last minute. So there's, I think there's greater movement and more violence in, uh, in Brunelleschi's, but, but the, 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 I think the composition is just it's more, uh, it's more classical, maybe a little more, more uh, uh, elegant in Ghibertes. Ghiberti also was a better bronze technician, so he used less bronze, which is always really good. Bronze is really expensive. So what happened is that uh, I always get my students to vote too on which one they like the best. I'm like, who do you think won? And it's really great. So anyway, then they have, a, they have to say which one they like the best. 
Brunelleschi always wins with my, with my youngins, but I, maybe, maybe you would pick, you would pick Ghiberti. But there are two, there are two versions of the, of the story or about the outcome of this competition. Ghiberti, in his own memoir, so in his own autobiography, said that he won without uh, competition. There was no debate that he won outright. <laughs> Everyone loved him. Uh, and in Brunelleschi's biography, which was written by another, another person called Manetti, he said that it was actually a tie between Ghiberti and Brunelleschi, and they were supposed to work together. And Brunelleschi said, nope, I'm not doing that. I'm going to Rome. Oh, there we go. I'm going to Rome. And he went down to Rome for 15 years in a huff over <laughs> being forced to work with his nemesis, Ghiberti, on the, on the, the doors. Anyway, uh, whatever story is, is accurate, uh, Ghiberti won this commission and, uh, and worked on these doors for a number of years. And you can, you can see them now uh, at the baptistry. And then he came back also to do his, his more famous doors. They're called the, the Gates of Paradise. And they're, oh, they just, they're in, there's a replica on the baptistry. But then there's a, there is a museum that's attached, is connected to the Duomo. It's like the Duomo Museum. Man, like you could skip the Uffizi and go to that one. It is so, so great. And there's nobody there because nobody knows about it. But Ghiberti's uh, Gates of Paradise, the original, are are in the, the museum and they just they're massive massive like golden doors and they just uh, go google them they're they're amazing so Ghiberti triumphant for now Brunelleschi goes down to to Rome and and starts padding about the the ruins Rome was a bit of a dump we talked about this before Rome was was not in ascendance yet we had to wait for Julius II so, so the, but the Roman ruins were beginning to be discovered and they were like, there are some really interesting things. The ancient Romans were kind of interesting. They were doing really neat things and building really cool structures. And so, so Brunelleschi was there, we, we think, poking around. He was also hanging out with his pal Donatello. <laughs> it's like one of those things, like, you know, uh, uh, Monet and Renoir would go off together and, and, and paint the boats and it's like these, art chums. It's like, how do they know each other? But I guess there's only 50,000 people. Anyway, Donatello and Brunelleschi were pals. Uh, I think they were both as um, maybe uh, uh, grumpy or, or prone to, to uh, fits of rage as each other. And they like to kind of roam about the streets and get into, get into a bit of trouble, youngins in Rome. And uh, Donatello had a notorious uh, temper. He, he was hell-bent on murdering one of his assistants one time and chased him through the countryside. This is Donatello's David. So this is, this is a very important, one of the, again, one of the most important uh, sculptures of the, of, the, of the Renaissance, the early Renaissance. But I'll save Donatello for another day. But just to, just to frame up who Brunelleschi was, was hanging out with. And we think that, that Brunelleschi, there's, there's not a great deal of evidence for this, but we think that Brunelleschi was spending his time in Rome looking at the, the architecture in Rome and, and really trying to figure out how did these Roman architects construct these things. So the Romans knew how to build domes, they knew how to build arches, and, and that, that knowledge had been lost over the course of the... Uh, of the medieval period. Where did that go? Oh yeah, I, for, I completely forgot to tell you about this. This is, a, this is a scene, so back up a bit, forget about Rome. This is a scene, um, this is a medieval uh, bronze relief from about 400 years before Ghiberti and Brunelleschi did their version. And so you can see, this is, this is not the same scene, but it's, it's God expelling Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden. But you can see the, the, the difference between Ghiberti. So you can see that this is, the, this is the start of the Renaissance. This is the foundation of the Renaissance here. And this is, this is the medieval aesthetic. This is the medieval design, the medieval approach. So uh, big heads, not so much interest in human anatomy. The, the narrative is what's really, really important in the, in the Middle Ages, in, in the medieval period. They need to communicate the message of this, this new faith. 
So you can read, you can always read medieval sculpture or medieval uh, uh, paintings uh, very easily. You can tell exactly what's, what's going on. So here God, so Adam and Eve have eaten of the, of the, the, uh, the forbidden tree and God has figured it out. God has a halo. God is very important. God is also the biggest. God, you can see his eyes, big eyes, and he's pointing and there's nothing to distract from, from his gesture, from his pointing hand. God points to Adam, what did you do, Adam? And Adam, they're, they're, they ate of the tree of knowledge, so then they, they, they feel shame. So Adam, with one hand, is covering himself, and with the other hand, he's reaching under his arm and he's pointing at Eve. It wasn't me, it was her. <laughs> and then Eve, I love this gesture, so Eve is covering herself, and with her, her hand, she's pointing down at the serpent. It wasn't me, it was the serpent. And you can read this from one to the next, the, the emotions, the narrative here is so, so clear. And again, look at the, the anatomy in, in Adam and Eve. There's no, they're not interested. It's not that they forget. So there's this, kind of this idea about the middle, the middle Ages being the Dark Ages and they forgot. They, they didn't forget how to depict human anatomy. It just wasn't as central. It wasn't as important as the narrative in communicating this idea. Eve has one breast. You can, you know it's a woman, you know it's Eve, right? Like they're not, they don't, well, it doesn't matter that much. But look at the difference, oh, right? I mean, this is, this is of a time, this is of a period, and then this is something, this is something markedly different. Like we are in a different, something different is happening here, and Ghiberti cares about something very, very different from what, uh, what the medieval sculptors and artists cared about. So the narrative isn't as uh, intuitive here. You have, to, you, have to, uh, you have to dig a little deeper to discover it. And he's interested in, in the elegance of the human body and how the human body can convey uh, an idea. There we go. I forgot something. Let's go back to Brunelleschi in Rome. So, Ghibera, so, so Brunelleschi is, is, uh, is investigating these, these Roman ruins, and we think that potentially he wanted to, to capture, or, or to be able to draw these, these structures in a realistic kind of way. So Brunelleschi casually uh, invents linear perspective. Uh, <laughs> So linear perspective is, uh, is, 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 a, is, is, is it's a method, it's a scientific method of accurately, like very, very accurately depicting the three-dimensional world, the world that we live in, on a two-dimensional surface. That, we don't think it existed in the Roman period. It might have, we have no, uh, they kind of approximate uh, uh, linear perspective, they approximate three-dimensional space sometimes, but we haven't found any Roman writing or, or a, a painting that would show that the Romans, the ancient Romans, knew exactly how linear perspective worked. So, uh, so art historians sometimes say that Brunelleschi rediscovered or discovered linear perspective just to kind of hedge our bets a bit. But for the purposes of tonight, whatever, he's the inventor of linear perspective, go Brunelleschi. And, uh, and, and you, you probably remember, you probably learned a bit of this in school, you know, they make you draw the lines, and, and essentially how it works is there's a, there's a vanishing point on the horizon, and you identify the vanishing point, and then all of the, the they're called the uh, orthogonals, so they're the lines that recede into the distance. They all have to move towards the vanishing point. So you know when you're looking down, if you're, imagine if you're standing on a set of train tracks, and you're looking off into the distance, the, the train tracks are the orthogonals and they will eventually meet off in the distance. And, and it's a way of approximating uh, three-dimensional space on a, on a two-dimensional surface. And you can measure this all out. There's a way to the, the diagonal thing and you measure it. And so, so what he did, there was a famous experiment that Brunelleschi did at the baptistry where he did a drawing of the baptistry with using, employing his system of linear perspective and then he poked a hole in a, in a mirror and then he would look through his painting, look through the mirror and look at the baptistry and then he would look at his drawing in the mirror and just make sure that they lined up, like were they similar? That was kind of his, his test, as close as he could, he could get to a, a true test. 
And, and lo and behold, it did work. Linear perspective, Brunelleschi's invention. So he was, I probably should have said this, he was a genius engineer, like a genius architect. So he was kind of not, he was one of these kind of uh, Michelangelo-esque characters that had his hand in a bit in sculpture and in a bit in architecture and a bit in engineering. Anyway, uh, then linear perspective drives art then for the next three or 400 years. So uh, Brunelleschi is pretty, uh, a pretty, pretty important figure in art history. So it allows, it allows artists to do something like this. You can render then essentially any object, any, any three-dimensional object uh, very, very accurately on a two-dimensional surface. Romans. So this is, a, this is just an example I pulled from, uh, from the Middle Ages. They had no idea how linear perspective works. And, uh, and that's why it, it, things look a little flat. It looks like the figures are kind of floating in space. It looks like this chair has been kind of peeled open a bit. There, there's a, it just, it, the, the spaces always just look a little off, right? As opposed to something like this. There are these artists, I love the early, the early Renaissance, because it's like they figured out linear perspective and they're like, I've got this. I know how linear perspective works. So I love these lines. I can do orthogonals. And then the vanishing point is by the door there. There's a slightly more elegant use of linear perspective in Leonardo's Last Supper. So yeah, this is a little, a little more subtle here, but the vanishing point is actually right at the head of Christ. And then you follow these lines in and all of the lines and the lines on the ceiling all point to the, to the vanishing point. So these, these figures feel very anchored in the space. And you could actually take a measurement from this and recreate this room based on the, on the scientific perspective here, so on the, on the linear perspective. So Brunelleschi's poking about Rome, and he also comes into contact, he would have seen, of course, the, the great pantheon uh, in, in Rome. And this is a, a, a massive, incredible, daunting structure for anyone uh, who has seen it. I think we still feel that impact when we walk into it. And, and again, like nothing, nothing like this existed in the world, so, so uh, Brunelleschi would have, would have felt that. And he's, Again, you can kind of imagine him, like everyone knew about the dome, this dome project that was looming over Florence. And, and, um, and, and you can just imagine, and we don't have direct proof of this, but you can just imagine Brunelleschi hanging out in the, in the Pantheon trying to figure out how, how this, this dome structure worked. So <laughs> coming back to uh, 1418 and the, the Opera del Duomo, the, the competition, the, the, the idea of Neri's dome, so Neri's uh, model, there was actually a model a constructed, like a physical model. It wasn't just a drawing. It was a, a model that was about 30 feet long. It was, it was actually quite massive of the dome. And it was, they put it in a side aisle in the nave here. So this is, again, the nave. So the model was placed in here. And it was, it was almost, it was revered for 100 years as a, almost as a shrine or as a, as a reliquary. Like they believed in this monument, they wanted this dome. And every year the, the architects and the builders who were working on the cathedral, because it was still under construction over the century, had to swear an oath on a Bible that they would adhere to Neri's, Neri's model, Neri's conception of the, of the dome. So no, no cheaping out, no spires, no flying buttresses. We gotta do this, guys. So uh, uh, the, the issue, it, well, maybe I'll back up. I'll talk a bit about the competition. So the, the, the competition was to come up with not, not the design for the dome, but how can this be engineered? What is an engineering solution for constructing this dome? Like, how can this actually be built? And so there, there were a whole bunch of ideas. Some were, were uh, not so good. So there was one idea that you could pile a, um, uh, that they would pile up um, mud and dirt and, and in through the whole, I don't even know how to explain this, it's so wild. They would pile dirt, 150, 170 foot pile of dirt, 
and then they would build the dome up around it. So then, the, the, does that make any sense? Like it's a mound of dirt, and they would build a dome around that, and they would fill the dirt with. This is a real thing. This is a real suggestion. Okay, they would fill the dirt with coins, so that then once they had the dome constructed, they would let loose the illiterate masses, and the illiterate masses would sift through the dirt trying to find the coins. <laughs> There's actually a cathedral that was reportedly built using this scheme. Anyway, uh, the Florentines didn't, didn't buy that uh, idea, thank goodness. Uh, there, there were a few other, a few other designs, and like I said, Brunelleschi comes along with a solution, but the problem was is that when you're constructing a, an arch or a dome, you need a wooden centering, you need wooden scaffolding. So what, what locks a, an arch or a dome in place is the, is the keystone, right? So that's the stone at the very top. And once you have the keystone in place, then the weight is, is distributed down and out throughout the arch. But until the keystone is locked in place, there's nothing to prevent the sides from collapsing inward. So you need wooden centering in order to, to, uh, to hold, hold the arch in place while, you're, while it's under construction. But it's also Tuscany. There is no wood, right? They've, they've torn it down over the last, uh, like I said, forests were completely demolished uh, in order to, to construct the, the earlier chunk of the, the cathedral. So uh, yeah, Tuscany, there's, there, there's not enough scaffolding, not enough wooden scaffolding, uh, or not enough timber to create wooden scaffolding. Because again, remember, it's not just, it's not just the, the, the centering Where'd it go? There we go. The centering had to be built. There had to be scaffolding 170 feet up in the air to get the builders up to the dome itself. So the also, the, the competition was also, how are you going to find enough wood to create the scaffolding? And Bruno Leschke said, no problem. I can do it without centering. I can do it without wooden scaffolding but I'm not gonna tell you how. And he somehow, we're not entirely sure, he somehow convinced the, uh, the uh, Diapo del Duomo, the committee, to hire him. I, a leap of faith for the, the creator of, of linear perspective, perhaps. But they said, okay, Bernaleski, you can, you can execute your model, your plan, we believe in your, your engineering prowess, but you have to work with Ghiberti. <laughs> <laughs> and they assigned Ghiberti and Brunelleschi basically as co-architects on this project, which irked Brunelleschi to no end. He hated it. He hated being saddled with Ghiberti. And, uh, and he thought that he was the real genius. It turned out he was, like he actually did have a plan. And it was a, it was a very frustrating partnership because uh, Brunelleschi, as I've talked about, all of his notes were in ciphers. He was very secretive. He wouldn't tell anyone. How, uh, how to construct, uh, how, what his ideas consisted of. But essentially his, his idea was to make the dome as light as possible. So where did this go? Where's the pantheon? Oh no, I went too far. I thought I had a picture of the pantheon. Let's go back to the pantheon. Oh, now I've ruined it. Okay, backing up. Here we go. Okay, the Pantheon. Uh, arches and domes exert downward and outward pressure, okay? So you either compensate for that downward and outward pressure by employing uh, flying buttresses, which they didn't want to do, or you have to make the structure extremely light so that the walls can withstand the, the, the pressure. And that's, that's what the, the Pantheon, the architects of the Pantheon did. The walls of the Pantheon are 23 feet thick. And then it decreases to just a few inches at the top. And it moves from, from very solid stone at the base to basically like a, you know, like, um, like a lava, not lava, pumice stone, like, like fluffy volcano stuff, okay, that's really light. It's basically fluffy volcano stuff at the, at the top. So that's how the Romans compensated. And it's not, it's not perfect, like they had to leave an oculus, they had to leave a hole at the top, because they just, they couldn't make it all the way there. Uh, 
So a 23-foot wall was not a, a, a potential solution for, for, the, for the Duomo, for the Florentine uh, Dome, because they already had the walls uh, built. So what, what Brunelleschi decided to do was to build uh, basically two, two uh, like a, uh, a dome within a dome. So the Florentine, the Duomo on the Florentine, or the dome on the Duomo uh, is essentially, it's hollow, basically. And there's a set of, you see these, these ribs, there are the eight ribs on, on the outside, but there are many more ribs hidden on the inside. So here's the, here are the external ribs that we see, but then there are many more ribs on the inside uh, strengthening the structure. And then he also has like a, it's a, a set of like looping each, each ring is, is interlocked to, to counteract the hoop stress. So it's like a, he looked at barrels. It's like, like those iron rings around barrels or metal rings around a barrel, so it keeps it, keeps it all together. So he had these, these, um, these ribs and then, and then kind of uh, concentric uh, uh, ribs, or not ribs, uh, rings going up the, the dome, which you can't see because he has this kind of false exterior that looks like it's just kind of floating there, but, it's, uh, but there's a hidden inner dome that's really providing the, the strength for this. And you can actually walk up inside. Like sometimes there's people up in the, up here by the lantern, because there's a set of stairs. You can go up inside the, inside the dome. Uh, so, so that, was, that was his scheme for making the dome as light as possible. And he also invented, that's a terrible horse, look at that horse. Uh, he, uh, he invented uh, all new kinds of machinery and new scaffolding that, that basically he didn't have to use, uh, like I said, that wooden centering or that wooden scaffolding. And uh, he, he invented or in, in redesigned what's called an ox hoist. And uh, so oxen can't, they, they can only pull hoists in a certain direction. They can't back up ox, apparently. Um, but he, he made this kind of mechanical system that he could flip a switch and it would reverse. Anyway, mechanical genius, basically. He came up with all kinds of these, uh, these designs to, so that, that he could hoist up these massive amount of bricks and marble up 200 feet up in the air. Oh, and he also designed new barges to, to, to withstand the weight of the amount of materials that he was shipping down the Arno River. So yes, again, just like, so much like, like, like Leonardo and Michelangelo, it's like they're presented with a problem. It's like, we need so many bricks to construct this thing and we don't have a big enough barge. We don't have the proper mechanics on the barge. And he's like, I will design a new barge. And he solved the problem of, uh, of working with Ghiberti rather deftly, too, over the course of the, the construction. When they were moving on to the, the, the section where they needed to start building the, the rings, like the, the kind of the, to counteract the hoop stress, he didn't tell anyone exactly how to build these rings. They were kind of like these, these wooden things that had to be interlocked together. And, and he pretended to be sick. He was like, I can't come in today. I'm so sick. And he stayed in bed. I'm deathly ill. I think I'm going to die. You better ask Ghiberti how to build the rings. So, so then they go to Ghiberti. This is the, the builders. Ghiberti, can you build the rings? We don't know how to do it. And Brunelleschi's on his deathbed. And, and Ghiberti didn't know how to do it because Brunelleschi hadn't showed him any of his notes. So, so Ghiberti starts off and, well, we'll try this and try this and try this. And, and then it, was, it wasn't going very well, so they go back to Brunelleschi and, and we really, really need you and I'm still ill, I'm so sick. And, uh, and, then, and then after enough time had passed that Ghiberti could make a real mess of it, Brunelleschi jumps out of bed and declares himself miraculously cured, comes back to the site, the construction site at the Duomo and like, man, Ghiberti, you're an idiot, look at the mess you've made. <laughs> And then uh, Ghiberti basically falls off the project. They kind of stop paying him, uh, which I guess means you're fired. And, uh, and Brunelleschi becomes like the, the main architect and his salary just increases, increases, and increases. And he's, 
he's, he's known as the architect of, of, the, of the dome. Nobody cares about Ghiberti unless you're looking at the doors. <laughs> well done, Brunelleschi. So, so yes, I mean, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's this kind of central part of, of, of the Florentine skyline, but more than that, it's this, it's this symbol of what Florence meant to the early Renaissance. So the Renaissance needed Florence, uh, and Florence's, uh, uh, or the, the Florentine vision of his Florentine kind of leap of faith uh, in, in the humanist philosophy or the human idea. Uh, in order to uh, to construct this, I mean, it's just a really, again, this kind of this this feat of of one person's mind, and and uh, and this this faith that that an engineer or an architect would come along who would be capable of constructing such a thing, and it really looks like uh, like what what the, the idea behind Renaissance architecture is uh, is elegance and uh, a balance and calm, as opposed to something like, again, we looked a lot at, at Gothic architecture, which is very busy, and the same thing for Baroque, a Baroque architecture, which comes after, is very opulent and very like, visually uh, like overwhelming. But, but the, the, the Renaissance, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's elegance, it's kind of contained uh, elegance and balance, which, which which we can see here. I mean, it looks like the, the dome looks like it's like it's floating, like it's being pulled upward kind of weightlessly. And there is this, this marvelous symmetry also to it, which is, is a very defining, uh, very much a defining feature of Renaissance architecture. They didn't care about that so much in the medieval period, and again, not really at all in the Baroque. Who cares about symmetry? But, but the, the Renaissance was about, about balance and harmony. Go to Florence, it's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you.